Howdy there, squirrels. Chapter two of our book, N or M, Tommy and Tuppet's Mystery. Uh, chapter two. Half an hour later, when Tuppence broke in, panting and eager with curiosity, Tommy was alone whistling in an armchair with a doubtful expression on his face. Well, demanded Tuppence, throwing an infinity of feeling into the monosyllable. Well, said Tommy with a somewhat doubtful air, I got a job of, of kinds. What kind? Tommy made a suitable grimace. Office work in the wilds of Scotland. Hush, hush, and all that, but don't sound very thrilling. But doesn't sound very thrilling. Both of us, or only you? Only me, I'm afraid. Blast and curse you. How could our Mr. Carter be so mean? I imagine they segregate the sexes in these jobs, otherwise too distracting for the mind. Is it coding or code breaking? Is it like Deborah's job? Do be careful, Tommy. People go queer doing that and can't sleep and walk about all night groaning and repeating 973845286 six or something like that and finally have nervous breakdowns and go into homes. <laughs> Not me. Tuppence said gloomily, I expect you will sooner or later. Can I come too, not to work, but just as a wife? Slippers in front of the fire and a hot meal at the end of the day? Tommy looked uncomfortable. Sorry, old thing. I am sorry. I hate leaving you. But you feel you ought to go, murmured Tuppence reminiscently. After all, said Tommy feebly, you can knit, you know. Knit, said Tuppence, knit, seizing her balaclava helmet, she flung it on the ground, seizing her balaclava helmet, she flung it on the ground. I hate khaki wool, said Tuppence, and navy wool, and air force blue, I should like to knit something magenta. <laughs> it has a fine military sound, said Tommy. Almost a, suge a suggestion of Blitzkrieg. He felt definitely very unhappy. Tuppence, however, was a Spartan and played it up well. Admitting freely that, of course, he had to take the job and that it didn't really matter about her. She added that she had heard they wanted someone to scrub down the first aid post floors. She might possibly be found fit to do that. <clears throat> Tommy departed for Aberdeen three days later. Tuppence saw him off at the station. Her eyes were bright, and she blinked once or twice, but she kept resolutely cheerful. Only as the train drew out of the station and Tommy saw the forlorn little figure walking away down the platform did he feel a lump in his own throat. War or no war, he felt he was deserting Tuppence. He pulled himself together with an effort. Orders were orders. Having duty, duly arrived in Scotland, he took a train the next day to Manchester. On the third day, a train deposited him at Leehampton. Here he went to the principal hotel and on the following day made a tour of various private hospitals and guest houses, seeing rooms and inquiring terms for a long stay. Sansucci was a dark red Victorian villa set on the side of a hill with a good view over the sea from its upper windows. There was a slight smell of dust and cooking in the hall and the carpet was worn, but it compared quite favorably with some of the other establishments Tommy had seen. He interviewed the proprietress, Mrs. Perenna, in her office, a small and tidy room with a large desk covered with loose papers. Mrs. Perenna herself was rather untidy, was a rather untidy looking, never mind, <laughs> was rather untidy looking, a woman of middle age with a large mop of fierce, fiercely curling black hair, some vaguely applied makeup with a and a determined smile showing a lot of very white teeth. 
Tommy murmured a mention of his elderly cousin, Miss Meadows, who had stayed at San Suchi two years ago. Mrs. Perenna remembered Miss Meadows quite well. Such a dear old lady, at least for at least perhaps not really old, very active in such a sense of humor. Tommy agreed cautiously. There was, he knew, a real Miss Meadows. The department was careful about these three about these points. And how was dear Miss Meadows? Tommy explained sadly that Miss Meadows was no more, and Mrs. Perenna clicked her teeth sympathetically and made the proper noises and put on a, com a correct morning face. She was soon talking volubly again. She had, she was sure, just the room that would suit Mr. Meadows. A lovely sea room. She thought Mr. Meadows was so right to want to get out of London. Very depressing nowadays. So she understood. And of course, after such a bad go of influenza. Still talking, Mrs. Perenna led Tommy upstairs and showed him various bedrooms. She mentioned a weekly sum. Tommy displayed dismay. Mrs. Perenna explained that prices had risen so appallingly. Tommy explained that his income had unfortunately decreased, and what with taxation and one thing and another. Mrs. Perenna, gro yeah, Perenna groaned and said, This terrible war. Tommy agreed and said that in his opinion that fellow Hitler ought to be hanged. A madman, that's what he was, a madman. Mrs. Perenna agreed and said that what with rations and the difficulty the butchers had in getting the meat they wanted, and sometimes too much, and sweetbreads and liver practically disappeared. It all made housekeeping very difficult, but as Mr. Meadows was a relation of Miss Meadows, she would make it half a guinea less. Tommy then beat a retreat with the promise to think it over, and Mrs. Perenna pursued him to the gate, talking more volubly than ever and displaying an archness that Tommy found most alarming. She was, he admitted, quite a handsome woman in her way. He found himself wondering what her nationality was. Surely not English. The name was Spanish or Portuguese, but that would be her husband's nationality, not hers. She might, he thought, be Irish, though she had no brogue, but it would account for the vitality and the exuberance. It was finally settled that Mr. Meadows should move in the following day. Tommy timed his arrival for six o'clock. Mrs. Perenna came out into the hall to greet him, to greet him, through a series of instructions. <sighs> Sorry, my eyes are doing crazy today. Uh, instructions about his luggage to an almost imbecile looking maid who goggled at Tommy with her mouth open and then led him into what she called the lounge. I always introduce my guests, said Mrs. Perenna, beaming determinedly at the suspicious glares of five people. This is our new arrival, Mr. Meadows. Mrs. O'Rourke, a terrifying mountain of a woman with beady eyes and a mustache, gave him a beaming smile. <laughs> Major Bletchley. Major Bletchley eyed Tommy appraisingly and made a stiff inclination of the head. Mr. Von Denham, a young man, very, very stiff, fair-haired and blue-eyed, got up and bowed. Miss Minton, an elderly woman with a lot of beads, knitting with khaki wool, smiled and tittered. I just love it when people titter. <laughs> oh, my, I'm 12 years old. And Mrs. Blankensop, more knitting, an untidy dark head which lifted from an absorbed contemplation of a balaclava helmet. Tommy held his breath and the room spun round. Mrs. Blankensop. Wait a 
minute. Mrs. Blankensop, tuppence, by all that was impossible and unbelievable tuppence, calmly knitting in the lounge of San Suchi. Her eyes met his polite, uninterested stranger's eyes. His admiration rose. Tuppence! And that's all. <laughs> that's all in chapter one. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. What time is it? I only read ten minutes. I'll try to read a little bit more. Chapter two. How Tommy got through that evening, he never quite knew. He dared not let his eyes stray too often in the direction of Mr. of Mrs. Blankensop. At dinner, three more... Habitues of San Suchi appeared, a middle-aged couple, Mr. and Mrs. Cayley, and a young mother, Mrs. Sprott, who had come down with her baby girl from London and was clearly much bored by her enforced stay at Leehampton. She was placed next to Tommy and at intervals fixed him with a pair of pale gooseberry eyes and in a in a slightly adenoidal voice, <laughs> said, or asked, Don't you think it's really quite safe now? Everyone's going back, aren't they? Before Tommy could reply to these artless queries, his neighbor on the other side, the beaded lady, struck, struck in. What I say is one mustn't risk anything with children. Your sweet little Betty, you'd never forgive yourself. And you know that Hitler has said the Blitzkrieg on England is coming quite soon now. And, a, and quite a new kind of gas, I believe. Major Bletchley cut in sharply. A lot of nonsense talking about gas. The fellows won't waste time fiddling around with gas. High explosive and incendiary bombs, that's what was done in Spain. <clears throat> the whole table plunged into the argument with gusto. Tuppence's voice, high pitched and slightly fatuous, piped out. My son Douglas says. Douglas indeed, thought Tommy. Why Douglas, I should like to know. After dinner, a pretentious meal of several meager courses, all of all of which were e equally tasteless. Everyone drifted into the lounge. Knitting was resumed, and Tommy was compelled to hear a long and extremely boring account of Major Bletchley's experiences on the Northwest Frontier. <clears throat> the fair young man with the bright blue eyes went out, executing a little bow on the threshold of the room. Major Bletchley broke off his narrative and administered a kind of dig in the ribs to Tommy. <clears throat> Tommy. That fellow who's just gone out, he's a refugee. Got out of Germany about a month before the war. He's a German? Yes. Not a Jew either. His father got into trouble for criticizing the Nazi, Nazi regi regime. Two of his brothers are in concentration camps over there. This fella got out just in time. At this moment, Taylor was taken possession of by Mr. Cayley, who told him at inter uh, interminable that wrong. Lent thought about his health, so absorbing was the subject to the narrator that it was close upon bedtime before Tommy could escape. On the following morning, Tommy rose early and strolled down to the front. He walked briskly to the pier, returning after the, ec the esplanade when he spied a familiar figure coming in the other direction. Tommy raised his hat. Good morning, he said pleasantly. Er, Mrs. Blankensop, isn't it? There was no one within earshot. Tuppence replied, Dr. Livingstone to you. How on earth did you get here, Tuppence? murmured Tommy. It's a miracle, an absolute miracle. It's not a miracle at all, just brains. 
your brains, I suppose. You suppose rightly, you and your uppish Mr. Grant. I hope this will teach him a lesson. It certainly ought to, said Tommy. Come on, Tuppence, tell me how you managed it. I'm simply devoured with curiosity. It was quite simple. The moment Grant talked of our Mr. Carter, I guessed what was up. I knew it. I knew it wouldn't be just some miserable office job, but his manner showed me that it wasn't going to be allowed, that I wasn't going to be allowed in on this. So I resolved to go one better. I went to fetch some sherry, and when I did, I nipped down to the Browns' flat and rang up Maureen, told her to ring me up and what to say. She played up royally, niece. No, nice high squeaky voice. You could hear what she was saying all over the room. I did my stuff. <clears throat> Registered annoyance, compulsion, distressed friend, and rushed off with every sign of vexation. Banged the hall door, carefully remaining inside it, and slipped into the bedroom and eased open the communicating door that's hidden by the tall boy. And you heard everything? Everything, said Tuppence complacently. Tommy said reproachfully, And you never let on? Certainly not. I wish to teach you a lesson, you and your Mr. Grant. He's not exactly my Mr. Grant, and I should say you haven't... And I should say you haven't taught him a... You have taught him a lesson. Mr. Carter... Who wouldn't have treated me so shabbily, said Tuppence. I don't think that intelligence is anything like, like what it was in our day. Tommy said gravely, it will attain its former brilliance now. We're back into it. <clears throat> but why Blankensop? Why not? It seems such an odd name to choose. It was the first one I thought of, and it's handy for underclothes. What? What do you mean, Tuppence? <laughs> B, you idiot. B for Beersford. B for Blankensop. Embroidered on my cami knickers. <laughs> They're draws. Patricia Blankensop. Prudence Beersford. What did you choose? Meadows? It's a silly name. To begin with, said Tommy, I don't have large bees embroidered on my pants, and to continue, I didn't choose it. I was to, told to call myself Meadows. Mr. Meadows is a gentleman with a respectable past, all of which I've learnt by heart. Very nice, said Tuppence. Are you married or single? I'm a widower, said Tommy with dignity. My wife died ten years ago in Singapore. Why Singapore? We've all got to die somewhere. What's wrong with Singapore? <laughs> oh, nothing. It's probably the most suitable place to die. I'm a widow. <laughs> Where'd your husband die? Does it matter? Probably in a nursing home. I rather fancy he died of cirrhosis of the liver. I see. A painful subject. And what about your son, Douglas? Douglas is in the Navy. So I heard last night. And I've got two other sons. Raymond is in the Air Force. And Cyril, my baby, is in the Territorials. And suppose someone takes the trouble to check up on these imaginary Blankensops. They're not Blankensops. Blankensop was my second husband. My first husband's name was Hill. There are three pages of <clears throat> Hills in the phone book. You couldn't check up on all the Hills if you tried. Tommy sighed. It's the old trouble with you, Tom. <clears throat> Wait a minute. It's the old trouble with you, Tuppence. You will overdo things. Two husbands and three sons is too much. You'll contradict yourself over the details. No, I shan't, and I rather fancy the sons may come. The sons may come in useful. 
I'm not under orders, remember. I'm a freelance. I'm in this to enjoy myself, and I'm going to enjoy myself. <clears throat> so it seems, said Tommy, he added gloomily, if you ask me the whole thing's a farce. Why do you say that? Well, you've been at San Suchi longer than I have. Can you honestly say you think any of these people who were there last night could be a dangerous enemy agent? And I'm going to stop right there, guys. My eyes are getting... They're aggravating me. Cataracts, be gone! Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. We'll get back on this. That. So many things. Love y'all. Did I say be sweet? Don't be ugly. If I did, and there you go. If I did, <laughs> here you go again. Love y'all. Bye.